We want to jump forward now to Mary Schlegel-Milk, who's the Cisco Education Consultant, and Shannon Red, who's also with Cisco Education, talking to us about how, how does hybrid impact your school? We've been hearing a lot about this this morning with the wild hybrid models. So Mary, I'm going to give it over to you and Shannon, introduce yourself a little further and tell us what you know. Well, good afternoon. And I'm just double checking. Can you see yep, our can presentation? See. Great. Yeah. Um, and you know what? I think it's not in SlideShare mode Maybe. yet, right? Yeah. There we go. There you go, Mary. We can see you. There we go. So I appreciate everybody's time today. And um, my name is Mary Schlegelmelk, and I'm with Cisco Systems. I came from the education space. Um, I was a former district administrator in charge of e-learning for a very large urban school in Nebraska. So that will kind of tell you where I'm at um, because we don't have that many urban areas in Nebraska. Prior to that, I was with, um, I was with a, a rural school, very tribal in South Dakota and with the university um, in South Dakota, as well as being at the university here in Nebraska. I've, um, we have something that we wanted to share with you today from Cisco, and I thought it would be really great to have Shannon Red with us as well today, who covers the DC public schools for Cisco. So with that, I'm just going to have Shannon give a little bit about her background. Sure. Um, thank you, Mary. So as uh, Mary said, I cover DC public schools, which is part of DC government as an account executive. But my passion, even before coming to Cisco, was around education and advocacy around education. So I've been on a couple of school boards um, in the D.C. area just to make sure that they've been able to execute on, on their goals. Um, now I get the privilege of working with DCPS uh, through their transition um, to institute better uh, education models. So really excited to be here today to kind of talk through what we've been doing there. And with that, I'm going to take us into some pictures from the past, right? Um, you know, what we're doing here at Cisco is truly reimagining education. Cisco. <laughs> I apologize. I have had everything shut down and it just barged through. It happens. <laughs> um, but at Cisco, we were, you know, born in education. Cisco is a company where two professors in two different colleges wanted to use the internet to connect and talk to each other because back in the day, there really was not this internet in which you could um, share files and things like that. And so Cisco, the company was born. But I'm even gonna take us back a hundred years or so to the industrial revolution and think about where have we been? We're in different types of rows up until just about 24 months ago. And now what we're seeing as we partner with um, school districts and universities, as well as partnering with the Learning Council is how can these spaces really change the way we think, the change the way we teach and the way we learn. And so we're helping schools all over think through what is the post-pandemic um, reimagined education model. We're really excited to think about, you know, brick and mortar is always going to have a place in our schools, but also anytime, anywhere learning does as well. It really needs to be that education first strategy. It needs to be centered about student retention and student success. And if we really focus in on student retention and student success, then we know the success of our faculty, the success of our staff and the success of our community is um, most important. So as we think through education, it's really about this hybrid campus with on-site or remote, and it's really about the elasticity of a campus. And with that, I really kind of wanted to stop a minute and have Shannon give us some, um, some mm, insights on what they did recently sure. in, in um, D.C. Thanks so much, Shannon. So when we're thinking about an education vision, right, we can uh, sit around and put together models, but we have to understand that vision has to be flexible, right? And that every school system isn't built the same way. And with our new normal, um, we're going to have to introduce hybrid models. And why they are so important is because the issues we're trying to address 
they're unique to each school system in a lot of different ways, depending on the students and the teachers and what that school system needs. So for example, DC Public Schools, it's one of the largest school districts in the country, serving over 50,000 students at 116 schools. 77% of their students are considered economically disadvantaged, okay? And students from these communities struggle with access to basic needs like shelter and food. So prior to COVID-19, many students relied on their physical attendance at school for food and access to the internet, right? So you can only imagine what happened when these students were sent home and the new normal became them having to access the internet from home and um, also for them learning in a new way where there were struggles previously with just in-person education. Also, DC Public Schools graduation rate for 2019 was only about 65% with some of the most disadvantaged high schools falling below 50%. So DC had unique challenges um, as an urban city to try to meet the needs of, uh, of their students as they transition to home and also provide equal access at the same time. All this technology, um, and they had to determine very quickly what model was going to work for them. Uh, I actually went out, I call it shopping, and I, uh, I went and talked to a lot of teachers and administrators to find out, you know, on the ground what some of the biggest issues are. And I think the Learning Council and a lot of you on here today will agree with what the teachers were telling me. And that was, you know, the quick transition to new platforms was overwhelming. Trying to get teacher, uh, trying to get uh, kids and parents adjusted to the new tools was tough as well. A lot of the tools didn't integrate with one another the teachers just didn't have the answer or solution to making this work. They just wanted to focus on teaching. Uh, they also wanted to provide a consistent experience while being able to access different models for children who had different needs. Um, they highlighted quick burnout, which I'm sure most of you understand, and the need for um, advanced devices beyond a laptop that could help them better engage with the students and security. Um, and overall, like I've, I've said, DC had a major issue with access, right? So this highlights something that is a part of our new normal. This is the need for technology models that will fit the school system and the population, which is the undercurrent to uh, hybrid models. Um, option for hybrid uh, learning, as well as technology to support hybrid learning that provides data and analytics to support managing hybrid environments. We have to know those environments and what um, is happening in them because now we're not physically together all the time, right? So we need to make sure we're providing the best education in the best form. Additionally, security, um, security of these technology tools that we're using so we can protect our most precious citizens, which are our students. And the need for devices and collaboration tools that will fit the new normal, right? So we couldn't just, we saw people just took home a laptop and said, hey, that's what I can use to teach my students. But it was so much more than that. So they needed more devices and a ways to connect with students that support a hybrid model and also uh, virtual instruction. So those were some of the highlights. That's just what has been happening in DC that I think is familiar for a lot of different school systems, even though you can also be very unique in your approach. And we think is the baseline to why we have to introduce flexible hybrid models that schools can adopt that have a great technology backbone like what Cisco offers. Mary? Well, thank you. And I think one thing that we also learned from many of our districts, and, and I know you were saying this with the DC schools as well, is it wasn't just the faculty and the staff or the faculty and the students. We now had to think about staff in a hybrid world. And mm -hmm. that's what we're really hearing from a lot of school districts is that wasn't even thinkable, you know, before the pandemic is could the purchasing department work from a hybrid type of environment? Or how about those that would be in HR? You know, so now this flexibility of a hybrid campus really allows for us to think about the students and the teachers, but also our staff that are in our schools. 
And so as we think about this, it really needed to be a platform for education that was consistent with the learning experience, but also platforms that could be used by all departments. No longer were we having the affordability to have siloed technologies for each and every department, now can we use one technology and, and really integrate that? And what I love about the application like ClassLink that was on right before us is, you know, through single sign-on, now everybody can be using these types of technologies. We want to make sure that these hybrid environments are, first of all, flexible and secure, like Shannon said, but then the second most important piece is interactive and engaging. I want my students to be able to raise their hand. And you know what? I can see it because a, an emoji comes up with a raised hand over my student um, in their picture. And so I want to have some additional experiences like, um, you know, polling options and whiteboarding capabilities, as well as the ability for me to give the students the ability to work in the application so that everybody can see as well. And those types of engaging things that we've done in the classroom, the teachers didn't quite have the skills on how to do that in a remote environment because this is really, truly, it was a new platform of learning and teaching for them. You know, our teachers said to us, hey, we knew how to use FaceTime. We knew how to do that, but we didn't have to teach through FaceTime. So now this was a different model in which they had to start thinking about, okay, we need a platform that's ease of use, that in, you know, we don't have to be a tech person to use it, um, and it has to be consistent. Is it going to be to where, oh, it's spotty with audio, or do we have problems with the video, or can we not always share? These are things that they were um, really, you, you know, working with. And so they wanted to have something to where can I walk into a classroom? And truly, the classroom now knows through the devices that I bring with me as a teacher, oh, it's going into my device and saying, yes, the calendar says that you're teaching chemistry in five minutes, it pops it up on my screen, and I can just do a one tap to join. I don't have to worry about a code to get in because it's all secure in the back end of it, but it's also very easy to use. When we think about these integrations of the classroom, we want to make sure that we can use any type of conferencing software, whether it be Microsoft Teams, Google, oh. Zoom, or even the Cisco WebEx. How can we have a device that can say, you know what, it doesn't matter. We're platform agnostic and we want to make sure that the video can follow the teacher automatically throughout the room. But also when the students are talking, can we have video that can help those students to engage with the remote students? Because remember, we're trying to create a classroom community just as if all of them were in person in our classroom. So when we have that hybrid model, we want that community to extend into the virtual space as well. Now, as we think about this, we're really going into some back-end things with the network. And, and with that, I'm going to let Shannon just go through a little bit more about how we look at device analytics, both in the classroom, but also on the entire network. Yes, of course. So thank you, Mary. The big thing about this, right? We can talk about hybrid learning all day. We can talk about um, what needs to go into how we are educating our students. And that's what you educators think about every day, right? But when we bring in technology, we have to be able to utilize it to help tell a story through analytics, as well as support what you are trying to do with a strong network and security to make sure everything is secure across that network so that you can focus on delivering the education. So part of that that we would like to highlight is device analytics, right? There, we have technology available that can help you understand more of the environment of where you are providing the education and tell you where you need to adjust. So we have density monitoring. Um, where you can see a heat map of where people are gathering so that you're making sure you're keeping them safe. These can also extend to safety precautions where in the past we haven't been able to get to um, altercations maybe at school when people are in person. So this helps as well. Um, classroom capacity counting, um, making sure that we are staying within the guardrails of what keeps everyone safe by how many people are there with our WebEx room systems. 
uh, proximity reporting of giving a history or retracing of where a device has been. So if you're, everybody typically has a device in their hand um, or how many people may be in a room and it can give automated actions or alerts so that we can inform those who are helping to keep us safe of what needs to be done in that space. Also spacing analytics. Um, the new normal is to be six feet away from one, one another and that hopefully that will change one day. But where we are right now, we need that information in order to keep our students safe as they begin to transition back to school, um, if that is the model that is put in place. Um, the, Mara, I think the next slide. Um, so context is key to helping districts with the post-pandemic requirements. So we've talked about all of these, but it really comes into um, a holistic view of how we approach uh, hybrid education. We have to think about the users. We have, like I said, DC has a unique student population. What are the needs here, right? And how does their system have to be set up? We have to think about the network. Is it agile? Is it strong? Is it going to be... Um, um, the most up-to-date so that it can manage all of the new devices and people who are entering on it? Is it secure so that we aren't letting the wrong things on so we can focus on the education and the hybrid environments that we are providing? And that's a safe experience. Devices, making sure we know the devices that are coming onto the network and providing users with those devices that are secure. And also the applications needed to make it work holistically, meaning that these applications are integrated, they're seamless, and so that everybody doesn't have to fickle around jumping from one thing to the next. And everything, I mean, and everything combined is um, helping to provide the backbone to how we are educating students in this new normal. The other part to this, and the important thing, is the flexibility. So school systems are all different in a lot of ways, but School systems should also be able to figure out how's the best uh, the best way to deliver their um, their education. So there should be some flexibility in what you choose in those applications and and how you bring that in. So there's flexibility all over hybrid environments, and that's the biggest thing we wanted to point out. Uh, the last thing, and I think. Mary, if you go to the next slide, there you go. Uh, for our DNA spaces. This is just highlighting one of the offers we have here at Cisco that kind of brings it all together um, to support a hybrid environment, giving you the analytics, the, vis the visibility and the security that you need to tell the story of what's going on in your environment and also to have more control over those who are coming into it. Because when you have people who aren't on site, when you have, as Mary stated, different groups you're trying to help integrate, including staff, educators, and the students, you need to be able to get analytics and have visibility. So we have safety and compliance um, that you'll be able to see with DNA spaces, um, how we're utilizing the space and location analytics, um, how we can optimize operations, because you'll start to see how what's higher use in the environment versus not. Uh, Wi-Fi onboarding for staff, so it's more seamless and we don't have to have as much hands-on. And then if we're having people come in and out or just seeing, enhancing the student experience of how they navigate spaces, DNA spaces can give visibility into all of that. So there are multiple tools here that will support a hybrid environment and also provide in pieces and part the flexibility that schools need to be able to execute on the environment they're trying to build in this new normal. Mary. Yeah, and I was just going to add, I think that this is a piece that, you know, um, DNA spaces is what we call this solution because it's on the network and it's looking at all of the applications and everything that's happening on the network to give a real-time data on a screen. And so it's it's letting the district, it's letting, it's creating reports of all of these things, which I think is really important. But pieces that I've worked with many schools in the just in the past few months is more of that that space utilization, utilization and location analytics piece, it's that smart buildings piece. We, we need to know who's accessing. Do we have a camera that shows us who's accessing a particular door? Do we know students going in and out of spaces and who they are? Again, like Shannon said, 
most students all have devices except for, you know, our real little ones. But what's <laughs> nice to know is if we need to get to some data to know where students were, we can do that using um, the network to give us that information. So as we think about all of this, you know, Cisco has been known um, for, you know, what we can do for networking, connectivity, and technology. But as we continue to work with the Learning Council, one thing that we're really excited about is when we look at models of learning, how does that technology stack change from the spaces, the physical and the virtual spaces of these learning models, whether we're using a hybrid, where some students are remote, some students are in person, or we're using a blended learning where everybody's going to be in person, but everybody has devices and we're getting them to different types of applications. Whereas you're going to hear later on a little bit more about the hybrid logistics. This is really when we start thinking about calendaring, where maybe we have real-time enrollment for a certain group of students that, that can keep going and be concurrent? Or do we start thinking about the roster of students of the junior class and a subset of that junior class that are enrolled in certain courses? And then think about how do they move throughout the building through space and through the motion of, of the courses that they need to be taking? When we take into consideration and use technology to help us with all these, the use of the online tools of security, flexibility, consistency, and engaging is really important. And the tech stack should stay the same through all of them so that you have consistency as students move from model to model. And as I say, when I did professional development with teachers, we want our teachers to be comfortable from classroom to classroom, not thinking, oh, I'm now in a different classroom. How do I run this system? How do I plug in this for audio and this to get to my computer? And, and how do I make this all work? We should be using the network to allow teachers to wirelessly just connect automatically, securely, it knows who they are and it's able to connect them to the platforms that they need. But also in that same turn, doing that for students as well as for staff. These are really important as we start thinking about synchronous and asynchronous learning of, hey, you're in person live and we need to be working with you. But also, when can we have those asynchronous moments of teaching and learning? These are important pieces as we look at learning models and we continue to look at the tech stack that's needed for those classrooms. These are some important questions that we're always asking. Now, as we do this, I, I'm going to take us to one of my favorite questions. Um, quotes. And, and this one really has to do with, you know, technology should help you leverage time, not take more time. It should be allowing you to restructure learning activities and allowing you to provide opportunities for rigorous instruction. If the technology is not allowing that to happen, then we have to really evaluate what are we doing with this technology? And I think that's really important as we think about the teaching and learning spaces of our schools, as well as the non-teaching and learning spaces of our schools. How can we use technology that can truly help um, those learning environments? And with that, Leilani, we're gonna close and ask if there's any questions. Well, that was awesome. I always have a million questions. I'm going to check just to make sure I don't have any questions coming in from any of our audience. But audience, feel free to raise your little digital hand or type something in. We really want that. Um, so here's what's really awesome about uh, what you're talking about is you're really embracing what you said, which was really perfect, is the motion. There's a new kind of motion going on. And it used to be sort of manufacturing line oriented, like the bell ring, everybody moves in the next class. It was very linear. If you really like mentally map what your little journey was like back when we were all in school, it was a linear thing. And it was like, there was mad, there was surges, everybody's in the hallway and now they're going to the next class. But now it's just random. It's all over the place from what we're seeing going on in schools. I mean, I was physically um, on campus in Orlando this last week in an elementary school and we got to watch, we were in a library, we got to watch through the windows all the little kids in motion. It was amazing, um, a very different thing than, than uh, mm -hmm. I've experienced mm -hmm. before. And then the other thing is um, you, you pointed to the fact that there's, there's now a sort of trend 
that is similar to what we experienced in the corporate market 20 years ago, which is in hybrid, there's this hoteling concept, right? Where member cor- member corporations, hoteling, you're, you're, there's a bunch of cubicles or offices set aside and because you're remote, but when you come in, you're treated as if you have your own space. That concept is, is starting to really take off. Mm-hmm. Um, you call it sort of homerooms or they're like Starbucks on campus where you could study, but you know, that you could study, but you're not like in a class class unless you go to the class. So, um, you know, that, that's a, th- these are all brand new things, this remodeling of time and space. And Shannon, I've been on campus in some of the DC mm-hmm. buildings back when we were doing the live events here. We we're hoping to do that again next year. And uh, we got to be on one of the campuses, it was an all boys campus. Oh yeah. Minority mm-hmm. campus. I, I don't remember the name of it, but it was awesome. Mm-hmm. And the teachers were like, being dads to the kids lined up before they go to class, you know, Hey, pull up your pants. Hey, do this or yeah. do that. Yeah. It was such an awesome thing. Um, definitely though, their motion was already different. This was pre pandemic. Yeah. You could see it um, just in terms of how they were running things. So I want you guys to comment on this, this change of spaces too, because I'm seeing this now impact your wide area network, right? So mm-hmm. let's say you're a big campus but now you're not really bussing everybody in ter- because you have some virtual hybrid kids out in the hinter regions. So maybe you set up like California's doing a virtual space. You take over some retail space and you have somebody's the, the oversight for it. But kids can go there if they don't have good wi- good Wi-Fi at home. But they're really just hoteling. You guys yeah. want to comment on that? Yeah. So that is actually something DC has been looking into and I'm working on with the greater DC government. Of getting public Wi-Fi access and other spaces where children can get to it that do not have it at home. Um, And so that they're able to learn in different spaces. Other things that have been thrown out, which we don't do here because um, we don't have a busing system, was even putting Wi-Fi on buses so kids could still have access there, right? So they could get their education. Um, I know they've done that in other cities. But for D.C. specifically, you know, there is a push to bring everybody back. There is, but we know that that's not going to be what it is for the new change in our new normal, right? There's going to have to be some hybrid spaces and we're working through those. But the idea is to have spaces set up, like you said, across the city or even within the schools that where they aren't, when it's not at full capacity for students to be able to come and have access to internet, right? That's a huge thing. And they need a strong network behind that. And it goes well beyond, as I mentioned in the presentation, just education. Some of these students need it for other reasons um, because they don't have it at home. Until the city can solve for that digital divide, student population, their connection to the internet is through schools. So they are setting up those kind of hoteling um, models for a variety of reasons that's that's honestly solving a, a larger social issue. Yeah, and also don't forget, Leilani, they're also it's the staff and the faculty. Many school districts said to us, we didn't realize that we had a huge population of staff that did not have um, connectivity and and computers at home. So we had to not only send home their work computer with them, we had to get it set up on a VPN so that they could get into the network so to do their work, but also they needed connectivity. And many times we had teachers saying, you know what, I'm using this collaboration software, but I don't have enough connectivity to run my video too. I'm not, I don't pay enough for that internet service. So the schools really had to think about their whole community for connectivity. Yeah. And that's where the digital divide and this real gap in connectivity has come to the forefront. Yeah, and there's other dimensions of that too. I'm glad you mentioned that because you know other places are talking about, you know they got six kids at home. They can't possibly all hit the Wi-Fi at once. Mm-hmm. And the older ones are like, I don't wanna stay at home and babies at the younger ones. Anyway, they're in my hair all day. Mm-hmm. There's all these dimensions that have come into play. And I, I think was, Virginia Beach is gonna be with us tomorrow, but. When we were out there a couple of years ago, one of the things I think it was them that mentioned, they have a, a landmass with houses on it across a water, a body of water. So Wi-Fi is real iffy for them too. So they had they had to do all kinds of creative things. They were talking about putting up their own tower and everything. Um, 
So it's a really interesting moment for networks and mm -hmm. in so many dimensions. But um, Shannon, I think you're totally right. The the drive to go back to school nationally is is from what we can see research wise twofold: social emotional. Because there's a good percentage of kids that really they learn better in a social environment. But right. there's that other percentage of kids, which we found out, that learn better not <laughs> not being around everybody. You know, the, right. I, I know a family that's where... That's being highlighted. And that's being yeah. demanded, right, from parents yeah. and students of how they approach education. And this isn't new. We do it in college all the time with yeah. virtual learning and hybrid learning. And now it's just reaching our K through 12. And we're learning our younger students actually benefit some of them from a hybrid education or a different model. And it just highlights there's a thousand ways to climb a tree and it's yeah. starting to touch our education space too. And I think that's a beautiful thing, right? Yeah. That's something great that's coming out. We just need the technology behind it to support all of it, to make it a great educational experience. Yeah, invisible and seamless and always on and don't all worry about it. Yep. Yeah, so yeah, I you. love it. I love the whole communication <laughs> that you guys made. Um, okay, well, stay on if you can, so you can also be part of the um, the later conversation with the panel, right? Um, but that was wonderful. Thank you guys so much for the work that you're doing. It's so critical, especially for equity. So serious about that. Yeah. So thank you guys very much.